Good afternoon. I hope you'll, you all enjoyed lunch and you enjoyed this morning, the session. Um, we shift gears now and discuss uh, cases uh, with advanced disease. So that's metastatic. So first, I'd like to uh, tell my uh, colleagues here, the panelists, uh, we heard from several of you to uh, avoid using uh, too many technical terms and medical terms or uh, scientific terms and try to be uh, using more terms that, uh, you know, patients and, and families can understand. So uh, renal cell carcinoma is kidney cancer. Uh, obviously, there are other types of kidney cancer. That's why we use the word renal cell, but that's the majority of kidney cancer. So um, without further uh, delay, we'll go ahead and uh, start with the first case. This is a 55-year-old male with, who presented with blood in the urine, and uh, he has excellent performance status, functioning, uh, performing activities of daily living without any uh, restriction. No significant uh, illness other than, uh, obviously, the kidney cancer, but he has slight anemia. The hemoglobin, red blood count, is a little low, 10.3, but the rest of the labs are normal. There is no evidence of metastatic disease by bone scan, uh, by MRI of the brain. And, but he does have, as we will see later on the next slide, uh, pulmonary nodules and a mass in the right kidney. So this is why he underwent a biopsy of this tumor in the right kidney, and it showed the most common type of kidney cancer, what we call uh, or refer to as clear cell renal carcinoma, Furman in grade three, as you heard from this morning, this is a, an aggressive tumor. And as you can see, obviously uh, the mass is uh, a large one, measuring approximately 14 centimeter this, say, this way, and about nine centimeter this way. So fairly large uh, tumor. Other views, you could see that he has, in addition to the mass here, the big kidney tumor, there is, this is the right kidney here, what's left, what you, what you see of it, and there is a enlargement of the right adrenal gland. There are two glands over each, uh, one over each kidney, and there is another uh, adrenal gland on this side, on the left side as well here. And you can see there are spots in the lungs, so he has evidence of metastatic disease to the adrenal glands and to the lungs. So what would you offer this patient? And question to my panelists. Um, and we'll start with our surgeons here. Uh, Dr. Mateen, would you do upfront cytoreductive nephrectomy? And would you remove both adrenal glands? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Yeah, I mean, and just to be clear, you know, we, we, um, we usually do these cases by discussing it with one another. I usually walk down his hallway. Um, and find him and, and, um, and talk, and so we don't make these decisions um, in a vacuum. <clears throat> you know, my looking at him, he's, he's having symptoms of, of, of hematuria, blood in the urine. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the cancer is in the kidney, uh, and so I would, really, I would consider actually doing removal of the kidney and the adrenal on that side. Whether you move, remove the cancer in the opposite adrenal or not gets to be a little complicated because sometimes um, there are clinical trials that they can be eligible for um, after removal of the kidney, but not if they're on steroid replacement. If you remove both the adrenal glands, the patient has to go on lifelong steroid replacement. And so it's just something to talk about. I think most case clinical trials now uh, don't exclude that factor. So it's just one of those things you want to think about just so you don't you know, just so you can set everything up for success. Um, but it's a discussion that needs to be had whether or not you remove that or not. Um, um, that would be my thinking, is just to do surgery first, at least, at the very least, remove kidney and the adrenal on that side. Consider the other side. Dr. Karam, do you agree? Uh, yes, I would agree with Dr. Mateen. And like you said, we don't make these decisions in a vacuum. We always discuss among each other, just like, what, like we're talking now in a less formal setting, but uh, I would choose uh, option number one after discussion uh, with you, unless there is a clinical trial that he is eligible for and wants to enroll. Um, choice number one would be my recommendation. Would you remove both adrenal glands or just the ipsilateral? 
uh, if the, right the aim side. is to make them disease-free in the abdomen and retroperitoneum, and if it doesn't interfere with any planned clinical trials, I would try to render him disease-free in the abdomen. So you would remove, remove both, both adrenal glands? Both adrenal glands. And the kidney and the lymph nodes as well. And the, okay. <laughs> Dr. Wood? Yeah, the issue here is um, I, I would recommend upfront set reductive surgery. And the real issue about the adrenals, not only clinical trials, but if they, you take both adrenals and it takes IL-2 off the table. And the, the, this patient, young, excellent performance status, uh, just metastatic disease to the lung and adrenal. Uh, if there is a candidate for IL-2, this would be one. So, uh, you know, by removing the adrenal, both adrenal glands, you would take that off the table for the patient. And I'd have that discussion with them. Um, but I think at the end of the day, uh, definitely cytoreductive nephrectomy, definitely removal of the right adrenal, and then a discussion about the left adrenal. And if the, if the medical oncologist thinks that IL-2 would, might be a, a good choice for this patient, then I would leave that uh, left adrenal. Dr. Pile, would you uh, uh, recommend upfront systemic therapy instead of surgery? No, I, I, I agree with my colleagues. Um, um, I think the challenge also for systemic therapy, you will commit this patient to a, th a therapy that they might not need uh, immediately. They're, these are, we call a, a synchronous metastasis, meaning the patient has newly diagnosed kidney cancer and also unfortunately has small lesion in the lungs and in the adrenal. Um, but he might not need uh, therapy um, right away. Different story probably for the immunotherapy where we want to try to treat the patient when the tumor is really small. So I would say I would agree uh, removing the kidney and assess the patient whether it um, would be candidate for high dose interleukin too. Dr. Harrison, what do they do at Duke? I, I totally agree. I mean, I think this is, a, this is a great patient to get cytoreductive nephrectomy and then the patient is young, um, sounds like is healthy has only a, a few risk factors and would otherwise be appropriate for high dose interleukin too. And so we'd really be thinking about that. Okay. All right, so if now we, uh, we did the surgery, we took the kidney out, uh, and we took the right adrenal gland out, um, and as per uh, the recommendations of our uh, surgeons, we left the left adrenal gland in. Now, uh, the patient recovers from surgery, um, and he's anxious to start systemic therapy. What would you pick from this menu? Dr. Pile? Well, again, I, th I think if, um, if uh, the disease is only in the lungs and he has a really too little nodule, um, I, there is nothing wrong actually for the patient to wait uh, because we don't know how fast this tumor has been growing. You know, if a patient's motivated, I would say, yes, I would offer high dose interleukin too. We have a trial of Roswell and Hopkins where we combine with antinostat. You know, it's an agent that make IL-2 hopefully work better. But I would also discuss, uh, even as young, you know, just maybe do another scans and in two or three months get the sense how fast those lung nodules are growing. Because sometimes we do see that those lung nodules do not grow. And why commit the patient to a therapy that unlikely will cure it? is cancer, but it will definitely make him sick, so. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up, because I was going to ask you, ask earlier, you know, before we had the TKIs, that was sort of standard practice. You know, we used to do the surgery, and we'd send them to you guys, but then in about 30% of cases, you guys wouldn't treat, you know, partly because the therapies weren't really that effective. But I'm glad you brought that up, because it seems like the threshold to want to treat is lower now. And so... Yeah, we're well, not saying it's lower, but I think it's... Um, I think not, not because we have a therapy, we have to use it right away. And yeah. I think uh, um, it's a discussion that uh, we need to do it with, with the patients. And some patients are uncomfortable. I mean, I need to disclose, I'm here actually to learn today, not to, uh, to, to talk about what I do, because I want to learn also from you, uh, since you are, you are patients, and uh, in, it, it's important for us also to get some feedback on how we should, uh, uh, discuss all these things uh, with with patients with uh, that actually involved in, in in the care. So, you know, I, I think it's an open it's an open question, especially when we don't know the natural history of this disease, and we know that sometimes kidney cancer grows very slowly. As you point out, uh, most of the tumor was in the kidney, so and it's really left 
little bit uh, left uh, behind. So there, there was not, nothing wrong to, to watch it. Dr. Harrison, would you like to add uh, the patient still has uh, uh, pulmonary nodules po six weeks post-op with repeat imaging studies. The left adrenal gland was uh, left in place, so he has metastatic disease to the lungs and to the left adrenal gland. And uh, the patient uh, will do what uh, you recommend. If you recommend, as Dr. Peel is recommending, uh, since he is asymptomatic, uh, to assess the behavior of this uh, tumor uh, you know, after a while, or would you say, let's go ahead, we have a window to cure you, let's try to start uh, some systemic therapy now without delay, or would you observe for longer? Well, I think, I mean, for the purposes of this, we're trying to be definitive. So to, to be definitive, I, I would, you know, I, I don't disagree with what Dr. Pilly said, and I don't disagree that it would be okay to watch the patient. I mean, we have so many options nowadays, I don't know that you're gonna lose a lot by, by monitoring for a little while and perhaps talking with the patient about their wishes more. But you also hate for a, a chance to miss a cure, and so what, what we're talking about when we're talking about high-dose interleukin-2 is we're talking about the only therapy that induces what we think are durable, complete responses. And so those are, it, it varies depending where you look, but maybe at three years, five to eight percent of patients have a, have a durable, complete response. Again, again, varies, and you hate to miss that. Now, I don't know that we would really miss that window if we waited for three months. So. I can't really push back that hard, but this is the type of patient that I would be a little bit more directive in personally, at least in trying to get them to consider and understand high dose interleukin-2 and understand what it could offer them, and if, if we don't offer it, to have a good reason why not. Okay, well, so the patient undergoes uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy with ipsilateral ad adrenalectomy. The pathology is consistent with clear cell, Firmonically grade four, T3A and zero M1, and he started on Sutent, uh, the standard dose and schedule. And uh, three months later, the patient has restaging and it shows partial response in the lungs, and no change in the uh, left adrenal gland, and the, and the therapy is continued, but it had to be reduced by 25% because of side effects, predominantly here hand foot skin reaction. And six months later, there is evidence of progression in the lungs with, new, uh, with uh, new tumors as well as increase in size of the existing tumors and increase in the left adrenal gland and a new uh, solitary liver metastasis. Now, what would, you, what would your option be now, Dr. Pilen? You have the option of serial metastasis. Well, first of all, I would be curious of why IL-2 was not offered or whether it was offered to this patient and the patient declined. Because as we know, unfortunately, high-dose interleukin-2, with all the caveat and limitation and toxicity, is still not offered to the majority of patients who are candidate for this approach. Uh, but, you know, it looks like this patient is progressing with new lesions, so this is definitely... Um, uh, warrants a change uh, in plan. Um, I think I found that the opportunity to increase the dose of sunidinib back to 50 intriguing. And why is that? Uh, we've been experiencing, and also other, that uh, definitely there is a dose-dependent effect. What does it mean? The more drug we can give it to the patient, the better it is. But we started also looking at that in, in some patients who are able to tolerate sunidinib, at the time of uh, progression, if we are able to dose escalate, to increase the dose, we do see responses. We have uh, some very nice uh, data also in animals where we observe the same things. We started with sunedinib. At the time of uh, resistance, we increase the dose, we see response. Um, but I, I, I think it, usually the approach, if a patient experiences a severe toxicity as a certain dose of sunidinib, we tend not to go back on the full dose. So I would be reluctant probably to go back on, on higher dose of sunidinib in this patient, unless it's tolerating the, the 37.5 very well. And we know that uh, as also 
I, I know that you have a manuscript from uh, from your institution in terms of uh, intrapatient dose escalation sunidine. A different schedule of sunidine might be helpful. So maybe this patient might still be able to go to 50, but two weeks on, one week off. One week off. This uh, schedule probably is more uh, tolerable for patients. Um, and we can still achieve a higher level of this drug. So maybe consider also that. Uh, long answer to a short question, but uh, alternative, I would uh, probably look uh, for a, a different mechanism of uh, uh, action of, of the drug. So I'm not a, a big fan of sequencing this drug. They, they have the same mechanism. So probably I would go with the Everolimus or a clinical trials that include Everolimus. Okay, Dr. Um, Harrison, since the patient did not get high dose interleukin to upfront and received uh, sunitinib instead, would you consider high dose interleukin two now? I would not consider high dose interleukin two at this point. I think there's definitely limited data, but what data we have shows that the high dose interleukin two is probably more toxic when it's given after these newer targeted therapies. So um, I, I know it you know has been done in, in some cases, but I would not recommend that. Dr. Wood, any role for surgery here? Uh, no, there's no role for surgery here. The disease is too extensive. And I think that, um, you know, my recommendation to this patient would be to do Everolimus or, um, or a clinical trial. And, uh, you know, I think that the, the teaching point here also is that uh, the window of opportunity with high dose IL-2 was when the patient first presented, it was the ideal candidate, but that bridge has been burned uh, with uh, getting the targeted therapy. Okay, so we move on to another case. Uh, this is a 55-year-old uh, uh, male with a uh, history of kidney cancer. In the past, he had a right radical nephrectomy with IVC thrombectomy more than a decade ago. Uh, and the pathology has shown a clear cell, um, T3B, N0M0, firm in grade 3. And he underwent routine surveillance studies. Last was two years ago, which was negative. Uh, he has no symptoms uh, except for history of prosthetic hypertrophy and kidney stones. Now, by CAT scan of the chest, he has multiple small pulmonary nodules, uh, but no other disease elsewhere. What would you offer this patient? And um, you see here also, Chris? Yeah, so, <clears throat> this is a you know, many patients ask when they're getting surveilled in the clinic, when can we stop this? When, do I, when can I stop getting CAT scans? Now, here's a guy that's 14 years out from surgery and uh, now has a new disease in his left adrenal gland. Uh, the, the other key point here, and Nazar, maybe you can point it out, is that, that when they did the right radical nephrectomy, they left the right adrenal gland, which is important because, uh, you know, again, Putting someone on adrenal replacement therapy for the rest of their life is not a very. Uh, can you point out the right adrenal? Mm -hmm. Putting um, uh, that's the there. There's the left, but you can see see on that picture right there, on the yeah down. That the right adrenal gland is in there. Um, but you know, making someone adrenal insufficient and having to take adrenal replacement therapy for the rest of their life is not very appealing. So. We have a solitary metastasis to the adrenal, no other evidence of metastatic disease. In my mind, this patient would best be served by a metastasectomy, uh, where we would go in and remove that mass with the associated left adrenal, um, and then observe afterward. What about uh, the uh, few pulmonary nodules, subcentimeter? Yeah, I mean, that's the issue. They're indeterminate. They could represent metastatic disease, um, but I would argue that if we sit and wait to see if they developed, then they will be metastatic disease. And so, you know, we'd have to counsel the patient that you do have these indeterminate nodules in the lung and that those nodules could represent metastatic disease and you might require additional systemic therapy in the future. But, you know, 55 years old, um, I say, you know, swing for the fences. <laughs>